Side 7 Man and His Symbols by Carl G. Jung Continuing with The Process of Individuation on page 220 Our dream life allows us to have a look at these subliminal perceptions and shows us that they have an effect upon us. After having an agreeable dream about somebody, even without interpreting the dream, I shall involuntarily look at that person with more interest. The dream image may have deluded me because of my projections, or it may have given me objective information. To find out which is the correct interpretation requires an honest, attentive attitude and careful thought. But, as is the case with all inner processes, it is ultimately the self that orders and regulates one's human relationships, so long as the conscious ego takes the trouble to detect the delusive projections and deals with these inside himself instead of outside. It is in this way that spiritually attuned and similarly oriented people find their way to one another to create a group that cuts across all the usual social and organizational affiliations of people. Such a group is not in conflict with others. It is merely different and independent. The consciously realized process of individuation thus changes a person's relationships. The familiar bonds such as kinship or common interests are replaced by a different type of unity, a bond through the self. All activities and obligations that belong exclusively to the outer world do definite harm to the secret activities of the unconscious. Through these unconscious ties, those who belong together come together. That is one reason why attempts to influence people by advertisements and political propaganda are destructive even when inspired by idealistic motives. This raises the important question of whether the unconscious part of the human psyche can be influenced at all. Practical experience and accurate observations show that one cannot influence one's own dreams. There are people, it is true, who assert that they can influence them, but if you look into their dream material, you find that they do only what I do with my disobedient dog. I order him to do those things I notice he wants to do anyhow, so that I can preserve my illusion of authority. Only a long process of interpreting one's dreams and confronting oneself with what they have to say can gradually transform the unconscious and conscious attitudes also must change in this process. If a man who wants to influence public opinion misuses symbols for this purpose, they will naturally impress the masses in so far as they are true symbols, but whether or not the mass unconscious will be emotionally gripped by them is something that cannot be calculated in advance, something that remains completely irrational. No music publisher, for instance, can tell in advance whether a song will become a hit or not even though it may draw on popular images and melodies. No deliberate attempts to influence the unconscious have yet produced any significant results, and it seems that the mass unconscious preserves its autonomy just as much as the individual unconscious. At times, in order to express its purposes, the unconscious may use a motif from our external world and thus may seem to have been influenced by it. For instance, I have come across many dreams of modern people that have to do with Berlin. In these dreams, Berlin stands as a symbol of the psychic weak spot, the place of danger, and for this reason is the place where the self is apt to appear. It is the point where the dreamer is torn by conflict and where he might therefore be able to unite the inner opposites. I have also encountered an extraordinary number of dream reactions to the film Hiroshima Mon Amour. In most of these dreams, the idea was expressed that either the two lovers in the film must unite, which symbolizes the union of inner opposites, or there would be an atomic explosion, a symbol of complete dissociation equivalent to madness. Only when the manipulators of public opinion add commercial pressure or acts of violence to their activities do they seem to achieve a temporary success, but in fact this merely causes a repression of the genuine unconscious reactions and mass repression leads to the same result as individual repression, that is, to neurotic dissociation and psychological illness. All such attempts to repress the reactions of the unconscious must fail in the long run, for they are basically opposed to our instincts. We know from studying the social behavior of the higher animals that small groups, from approximately 10 to 50 individuals, create the best possible living conditions for the single animal as well as for the group, 
and man seems to be no exception in this respect. His physical well-being, his spiritual psychic health, and beyond the animal realm, his cultural efficiency seem to flourish best in such a social function. As far as we at present understand the process of individuation, the self apparently tends to produce such small groups by creating at the same time sharply defined ties of feeling between certain individuals and feelings of relatedness to all people. Only if these connections are created by the self can one feel any assurance that envy, jealousy, fighting, and all manner of negative projections will not break up the group. Thus, an unconditional devotion to one's own process of individuation also brings about the best possible adaptation. This does not mean, of course, that there will not be collisions of opinion and conflicting obligations or disagreement about the right way in face of which one must constantly withdraw and listen to one's inner voice in order to find the individual standpoint that the self intends one to have. Fanatical political activity, but not the performance of essential duties, seems somehow incompatible with individuation. A man who devoted himself entirely to freeing his country from foreign occupation had this dream. With some of my compatriots, I go up a stairway to the attic of a museum where there is a hall painted black and looking like a cabin on a ship. A distinguished-looking middle-aged lady opens the door. Her name is X, daughter of X. X was a famous national hero of the dreamer's country who attempted some centuries ago to free it. He might be compared to Joan of Arc or William Tell. In reality, X had no children. In the hall we see the portraits of two aristocratic ladies dressed in flowery brocaded garments. While Miss X is explaining these pictures to us, they suddenly come to life. First the eyes begin to live, and then the chest seems to breathe. People are surprised and go to a lecture room where Miss X will speak to them about the phenomenon. She says that through her intuition and feeling, these portraits came alive. But some of the people are indignant and say that Miss X is mad, some even leave the lecture room. The important feature of this dream is that the anima figure, Miss X, is purely a creation of the dream. She has, however, the name of a famous national hero liberator, as if she were, for instance, Wilhelmina Tell, the daughter of William Tell. By the implications contained in the name, the unconscious is pointing to the fact that today the dreamer should not try, as X did long ago, to free his country in an outer way. Now, the dream says, liberation is accomplished by the anima, by the dreamer's soul, who accomplishes it by bringing the images of the unconscious to life. That the hall in the attic of the museum looks partly like a ship's cabin painted black is very meaningful. The black color hints at darkness, night, a turning inward, and if the hall is a cabin, then the museum is somehow also a ship. This suggests that when the mainland of collective consciousness becomes flooded by unconsciousness and barbarism, this museum ship, filled with living images, may turn into a saving ark that will carry those who enter it to another spiritual shore. Portraits hanging in a museum are usually the dead remains of the past, and often the images of the unconscious are regarded in the same way until we discover that they are alive and meaningful. When the anima who appears here in her rightful role of soul guide, contemplates the images with intuition and feeling, they begin to live. The indignant people in the dream represent the side of the dreamer that is influenced by collective opinion, something in him that distrusts and rejects the bringing to life of psychic images. They personify a resistance to the unconscious that might express itself something like this. But what if they begin dropping atom bombs on us? Psychological insight won't be much help then. This resistant side is unable to free itself from statistical thinking and from extroverted rational prejudices. The dream, however, points out that in our time genuine liberation can start only with a psychological transformation. To what end does one liberate one's country if afterward there is no meaningful goal of life, no goal for which it is worthwhile to be free? If man no longer finds any meaning in his life, it makes no difference whether he wastes away under a communist or a capitalist regime. Only if he can use his freedom to create something meaningful is it relevant that he should be free. 
That is why finding the inner meaning of life is more important to the individual than anything else, and why the process of individuation must be given priority. Attempts to influence public opinion by means of newspapers, radio, television, and advertising are based on two factors. On the one hand, they rely on sampling techniques that reveal the trend of opinion or wants, that is, of collective attitudes. On the other, they express prejudices, projections, and unconscious complexes, mainly the power complex of those who manipulate public opinion. But statistics do no justice to the individual. Although the average size of stones in a heap may be five centimeters, one will find very few stones of exactly this size in the heap. That the second factor cannot create anything positive is clear from the start, but if a single individual devotes himself to individuation, he frequently has a positive contagious effect on the people around him. It is as if a spark leaps from one to another, and this usually occurs when one has no intention of influencing others and often when one uses no words. It is onto this inner path that Miss X tried to lead the dreamer. Nearly all religious systems on our planet contain images that symbolize the process of individuation, or at least some stages of it. In Christian countries, the self is projected, as I said before, onto the second Adam, Christ. In the East, the relevant figures are those of Krishna and Buddha. For people who are contained in a religion, that is, who still really believe in its content and teachings, the psychological regulation of their lives is affected by religious symbols, and even their dreams often revolve around them. When the late Pope Pius XII issued the Declaration of the Assumption of Mary, a Catholic woman dreamed, for instance, that she was a Catholic priestess. Her unconscious seemed to extend the dogma in this way. If Mary is now almost a goddess, she should have priestesses. Another Catholic woman, who had resistances to some of the minor and outer aspects of her creed, dreamed that the church of her home city had been pulled down and rebuilt, but that the tabernacle with the consecrated host and the statue of the Virgin Mary were to be transferred from the old to the new church. The dream showed her that some of the man-made aspects of her religion needed renewal, but that its basic symbols, God's having become man and the great mother, the Virgin Mary, would survive the change. Such dreams demonstrate the living interest that the unconscious takes in the conscious religious representations of an individual. This raises the question whether it is possible to detect a general trend in all the religious dreams of contemporary people. In the manifestations of the unconscious found in our modern Christian culture, whether Protestant or Catholic, Dr. Jung often observed that there is an unconscious tendency at work to round off our Trinitarian formula of the Godhead with a fourth element, which tends to be feminine, dark, and even evil. Actually, this fourth element has always existed in the realm of our religious representations, but it was separated from the image of God and became his counterpart in the form of matter itself, or the Lord of matter, that is, the devil. Now the unconscious seems to want to reunite these extremes, the light having become too bright and the darkness too somber. Naturally, it is the central symbol of religion, the image of the Godhead, that is most exposed to unconscious tendencies toward transformation. A Tibetan abbot once told Dr. Jung that the most impressive mandalas in Tibet are built up by imagination or directed fantasy, when the psychological balance of the group is disturbed or when a particular thought cannot be rendered because it is not yet contained in the sacred doctrine and must therefore be searched for. In these remarks, two equally important basic aspects of mandala symbolism emerge. The mandala serves a conservative purpose, namely to restore a previously existing order. But it also serves the creative purpose of giving expression and form to something that does not yet exist, something new and unique. The second aspect is perhaps even more important than the first, but does not contradict it. For in most cases, what restores the old order simultaneously involves some element of new creation. In the new order, the older pattern returns on a higher level. The process is that of the ascending spiral, which grows upward while simultaneously returning again and again to the same point. A painting by a simple woman who was brought up in Protestant surroundings shows a mandala in the form of a spiral. In a dream, this woman received an order to paint the Godhead. Later, also in a dream, she saw it in a book. 
Of God himself she saw only his wafting cloak, the drapery of which made a beautiful display of light and shadow. This contrasted impressively with the stability of the spiral in the deep blue sky. Fascinated by the cloak and the spiral, the dreamer did not look closely at the other figure on the rocks. When she awoke and thought about who these divine figures were, she suddenly realized that it was God himself. This gave her a frightful shock, which she felt for a long time. Usually the Holy Ghost is represented in Christian art by a fiery wheel or a dove, but here it has appeared as a spiral. This is a new thought, not yet contained in the doctrine, which has spontaneously arisen from the unconscious. That the Holy Ghost is the power that works for the further development of our religious understanding is not a new idea, of course, but its symbolic representation in the form of a spiral is new. The same woman then painted a second picture, also inspired by a dream, showing the dreamer with her positive animus standing above Jerusalem when the wing of Satan descends to darken the city. The satanic wing strongly reminded her of the wafting cloak of God in the first painting, but in the former dream the spectator is high up, somewhere in heaven, and sees in front of her a terrific split between the rocks. The movement in the cloak of God is an attempt to reach Christ, the figure on the right, but it does not quite succeed. In the second painting, the same thing is seen from below, from a human angle. Looking at it from a higher angle, what is moving and spreading is a part of God. Above that rises the spiral as a symbol of possible further development. But seen from the basis of our human reality, this same thing in the air is the dark, uncanny wing of the devil. In the dreamer's life, these two pictures became real in a way that does not concern us here, but it is obvious that they also contain a collective meaning that reaches beyond the personal. They may prophesy the descent of a divine darkness upon the Christian hemisphere, a darkness that points, however, toward the possibility of further evolution. Since the axis of the spiral does not move upward, but into the background of the picture, the further evolution will lead neither to greater spiritual height nor down into the realm of matter, but to another dimension, probably into the background of these divine figures, and that means into the unconscious. When religious symbols that are partly different from those we know emerge from the unconscious of an individual, it's often feared that these will wrongfully alter or diminish the officially recognized religious symbols. This fear even causes many people to reject political psychology and the entire unconscious. If I look at such a resistance from a psychological point of view, I should have to comment that as far as religion is concerned, human beings can be divided into three types. First, there are those who still genuinely believe their religious doctrines, whatever they may be. For these people, the symbols and doctrines click so satisfyingly with what they feel deep inside themselves that serious doubts have no chance to sneak in. This happens when the views of consciousness and the unconscious background are in relative harmony. People of this sort can afford to look at new psychological discoveries and facts without prejudice and need not fear that they may be caused to lose their faith. Even if their dreams should bring up some relatively unorthodox details, these can be integrated into their general view. The second type consists of those people who have completely lost their faith and have replaced it with purely conscious, rational opinions. For these people, depth psychology simply means an introduction into newly discovered areas of the psyche, and it should cause no trouble when they embark on the new adventure and investigate their dreams to test the truth of them. Then there is a third group of people who in one part of themselves, probably the head, no longer believe in their religious traditions whereas in some other part they still do believe. The French philosopher Voltaire is an illustration of this. He violently attacked the Catholic Church with rational argument, écraser l'infâme. But on his deathbed, according to some reports, he begged for extreme unction. Whether this is true or not, his head was certainly unreligious, whereas his feelings and emotions seem still to have been orthodox. Such people remind one of a person getting stuck in the automatic doors of a bus. He can neither get out into free space nor re-enter the bus. Of course, the dreams of such persons could probably help them out of their dilemma, but such people frequently have trouble turning toward the unconscious because they themselves do not know what they think and want. 
To take the unconscious seriously is ultimately a matter of personal courage and integrity. The complicated situation of those who are caught in a no-man's land between the two states of mind is partly created by the fact that all official religious doctrines actually belong to the collective consciousness, what Freud called the superego. But once, long ago, they sprang from the unconscious. This is a point that many historians of religion and theologians challenge. They choose to assume that there was once some sort of revelation. I have searched for many years for concrete evidence for the Jungian hypothesis about this problem, but it has been difficult to find because most rituals are so old that one cannot trace their origin. The following example, however, seems to me to offer a most important clue. Black Elk, a medicine man of the Oglala Sioux, who died not long ago, tells us in his autobiography, Black Elk Speaks, that when he was nine years old, he became seriously ill, and during a sort of coma, had a tremendous vision. He saw four groups of beautiful horses coming from the four corners of the world, and then, seated within a cloud, he saw the six grandfathers, the ancestral spirits of his tribe, the grandfathers of the whole world. They gave him six healing symbols for his people and showed him new ways of life. But when he was sixteen years old, he suddenly developed a terrible phobia whenever a thunderstorm was approaching because he heard thunder beings calling to him to make haste. It reminded him of the thundering noise made by the approaching horses in his vision. An old medicine man explained to him that his fear came from the fact that he was keeping his vision to himself and said that he must tell it to his tribe. He did so, and later he and his people acted out the vision in a ritual using real horses. Not merely Black Elk himself, but many other members of his tribe felt infinitely better after this play. Some were even cured of their diseases. Black Elk said, even the horses seemed to be healthier and happier after the dance. The ritual was not repeated because the tribe was dead soon afterward. But here is a different case in which a ritual still survives. Several Eskimo tribes living near the Colville River in Alaska explain the origin of their eagle festival in the following way. A young hunter shot dead a very unusual eagle and was so impressed by the beauty of the dead bird that he stuffed and made a fetish of him, honoring him by sacrifices. One day, when the hunter had traveled far inland during his hunting, two animal men suddenly appeared in the role of messengers and led him to the land of the eagles. There he heard a dark drumming noise, and the messengers explained that this was the heartbeat of the dead eagle's mother. Then the eagle spirit appeared to the hunter as a woman clothed in black. She asked him to initiate an eagle festival among his people to honor her dead son. After the eagle people had shown him how to do this, he suddenly found himself, exhausted, back in the place where he had met the messengers. Returning home, he taught his people how to perform the Great Eagle Festival, as they have done faithfully ever since. From such examples, we see how a ritual or religious custom can spring directly from an unconscious revelation experienced by a single individual. Out of such beginnings, people living in cultural groups develop their various religious activities with their enormous influence on the entire life of the society. During a long process of evolution, the original material is shaped and reshaped by words and actions, is beautified, and acquires increasingly definite forms. This crystallizing process, however, has a great disadvantage. More and more people have no personal knowledge of the original experience and can only believe what their elders and teachers tell them about it. They no longer know that such happenings are real, and they are, of course, ignorant about how one feels during the experience. In their present forms worked over and exceedingly aged, such religious traditions often resist further creative alterations by the unconscious. Theologians sometimes even defend these true religious symbols and symbolic doctrines against the discovery of a religious function in the unconscious psyche, forgetting that the values they fight for owe their existence to that very same function. Without a human psyche to receive divine inspirations and utter them in words or shape them in art, no religious symbol has ever come into the reality of our human life. We need only think of the prophets and the evangelists. If someone objects that there is a religious reality in itself, independent of the human psyche, I can only answer such a person with this question. 
Who says this, if not a human psyche? No matter what we assert, we can never get away from the existence of the psyche, for we are contained within it, and it is the only means by which we can grasp reality. Thus the modern discovery of the unconscious shuts one door forever. It definitely excludes the illusory idea, so favored by some individuals, that a man can know spiritual reality in itself. In modern physics, too, a door has been closed by Heisenberg's principle of indeterminacy, shutting out the delusion that we can comprehend an absolute physical reality. The discovery of the unconscious, however, compensates for the loss of these beloved illusions by opening before us an immense and unexplored new field of realizations within which objective scientific investigation combines in a strange new way with personal ethical adventure. But, as I said at the outset, it is practically impossible to impart the whole reality of one's experience in the new field. Much is unique and can be only partially communicated by language. Here, too, a door is shut against the illusion that one can completely understand another person and tell him what is right for him. Once again, however, one can find a compensation for this in the new realm of experience by the discovery of the social function of the self, which works in a hidden way to unite separate individuals who belong together. Intellectual chit-chat is thus replaced by meaningful events that occur in the reality of the psyche. Hence, for the individual to enter seriously into the process of individuation in the way that has been outlined means a completely new and different orientation toward life. For scientists, it also means a new and different scientific approach to outer facts. How this will work out in the field of human knowledge and in the social life of human beings cannot be predicted. But to me, it seems certain that Jung's discovery of the process of individuation is a fact that future generations will have to take into account if they want to avoid drifting into a stagnant or even regressive outlook. Photo Captions The Rose Window of the Cathedral of Notre Dame, Paris Below, A Meander, a decoration in a 7th century manuscript. Individual dreams seem as strange and fragmented as the detail above from the decoration. But over a lifetime's dreaming, a meandering pattern appears, revealing the process of psychic growth. The psyche can be compared to a sphere with a bright field, A, on its surface, representing consciousness. The ego is the field center. Only if I know a thing is it conscious. The self is at once the nucleus and the whole sphere, B. Its internal regulating processes produce dreams. An earth altar beneath a tree in a 19th century Chinese painting. Such round or square structures usually symbolize the self to which the ego must submit to fulfill the process of individuation. A child adapting to the outside world receives many psychological shocks. Far left, the fearful first day at school. Center, the surprise and pain resulting from an attack by another child. Left, the grief and bewilderment of the first experience of death. As in effect a protection from such shocks, the child may dream or draw a circular, quadrangular, nuclear motif above that symbolizes the all-important center of the psyche. Far left, a woodcut from a 17th century alchemical manuscript depicts a king who has fallen ill, a common symbolic image of the emptiness and boredom in the consciousness that can mark the initial stage of the individuation process. Left, from the 1960 Italian film La Dolce Vita, another image of this psychological state. Guests explore the rundown interior of a decayed aristocrat's castle. Right, a painting by the modern Swiss artist Paul Klee entitled Fairy Tale. It illustrates a tale of a young man who sought and found the bluebird of happiness and so could marry a princess. In many fairy tales, such a talisman is necessary to cure illness or misfortune, symbols of our feelings of emptiness and futility. Three examples of a collective infection that can weld people into an irrational mob and to which the shadow, 
the dark side of the ego personality is vulnerable. Left, a scene from a 1961 Polish film concerning 17th century French nuns who were possessed by the devil. Right, a drawing by Bruegel depicts the affliction, largely psychosomatic, called St. Vitus's Dance, which was widespread in the Middle Ages. Far right, the fiery cross emblem of the Ku Klux Klan, the white supremacy secret society of America's South, whose racial intolerance has often led to acts of mob violence. Left, Anxious Journey by the modern Italian artist De Chirico. The title and gloomy passages of the painting express the nature of the first contact with the unconscious when the individuation process begins. The unconscious is often symbolized by corridors, labyrinths, or mazes. Right, on a papyrus, about 1400 B.C., the seven doors of the Egyptian underworld, itself seen as a maze. Below, drawings of three mazes, left to right a Finnish stone maze, Bronze Age, a 19th century British turf maze, and a maze in tiles on the floor of Chartres Cathedral. It could be walked as a symbolic pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Rather than face our defects as revealed by the shadow, we project them onto others, for instance, onto our political enemies. Above left, a poster made for a parade in communist China shows America as an evil serpent bearing Nazi swastikas killed by a Chinese hand. Left, Hitler during a speech. For over five years, this man has been chasing around Europe like a madman in search of something he could set on fire. Unfortunately, he again and again finds hirelings who open the gates of their country to this international incendiary. The quotation is Hitler's description of Churchill. Projections also flourish in malicious gossip, right from the British television series Coronation Street. Above, the wild white stallion from the 1953 French film Crin Blanc. Wild horses often symbolize the uncontrollable instinctive drives that can erupt from the unconscious and that many people try to repress. In the film, the horse and a boy form a strong attachment though the horse still runs wild with his herd. But local horsemen set out to capture the wild horses. The stallion and his boy rider are pursued for miles. Finally, they are cornered on the seashore. Rather than submit to capture, the boy and the horse plunge into the sea to be swept away. Symbolically, the story's end seems to represent an escape into the unconscious, the sea, as a way to avoid facing reality in the outside world. The shadow can be said to have two aspects, one dangerous, the other valuable. The painting of the Hindu god Vishnu, far left, images such a duality. Usually considered a benevolent god, Vishnu here appears in a demonic aspect, tearing a man apart. Left, from a Japanese temple, A.D. 759, a sculpture of Buddha also expresses duality. The god's many arms hold symbols of both good and evil. Right, the doubt-stricken Martin Luther, portrayed by Albert Finney in the 1961 play Luther by Britain's John Osborne. Luther was never sure whether his break from the church was inspired by God or arose from his own pride and obstinacy, in symbolic terms the evil side of his shadow. The anima, the female element in a male psyche, is often personified as a witch or a priestess, women who have links with forces of darkness and the spirit world, that is, the unconscious. Left, a sorceress with imps and demons in a 17th century engraving. Below, a shaman of a Siberian tribe who is a man dressed as a woman because women are thought to be more able to contact spirits. Above, a woman spiritualist or medium from the 1951 film The Medium, based on an opera by Giancarlo Menotti. The majority of modern mediums are probably women. The belief is still widespread that women are more receptive than men to the irrational. The anima, like the shadow, has two aspects, benevolent and malefic or negative. Left, a scene from Orphée, a film version by Cocteau of the Orpheus myth. 
the woman can be seen as a lethal anima, for she has led Orpheus, being carried by dark underworld figures, to his doom. Also malevolent are the Lorelei of Teutonic myth, below in a 19th century drawing, water spirits whose singing lures men to their death. The low right, a parallel from Slavonic myth, the Rusalka. These beings were thought to be spirits of drowned girls who bewitch and drown passing men. Above, four scenes from the 1930 German film The Blue Angel, which concerns a straight-laced professor's infatuation with a cabaret singer, clearly a negative anima figure. The girl uses her charm to degrade the professor, even making him a buffoon in her cabaret act. Right, a drawing of Salome with the head of John the Baptist, whom she had killed to prove her power over King Herod. Above, a painting by the 15th century Italian artist Stefano di Giovanni depicting St. Anthony confronted by an attractive young girl, but her bat-like wings reveal that she is actually a demon, one of the many temptations offered to St. Anthony, and another embodiment of the deadly anima figure. Above right, a British cinema poster advertising the French film Eve, 1962. The film is concerned with the exploits of a femme fatale, played by the French actress Jean Moreau, a widely known term for the dangerous women whose relationships with men clearly image the nature of the negative anima. The following is a description, taken from the poster above, of the central character of the film, a melodramatic description but one that might fit many personifications of the negative anima. Mysterious, tantalizing, alluring, wanton, but deep within her burning the violent fires that destroy a man. A man's stress on intellectualism can be due to a negative anima, often represented in legends and myths by the female figure who asks riddles that men must answer or die. Above, a 19th century French painting depicts Oedipus answering the Sphinx's riddle. Left, a traditional view of the demonic anima as an ugly witch, in a 16th century German woodcut, The Bewitched Groom. The anima appears in crude, childish form in men's erotic fantasies, which many men indulge through forms of pornography. Below, part of a show in a modern British striptease nightclub. In the 1953 Japanese film Ugetsu Monogatari, a man comes under the spell of a ghost princess, center above, an image of a projection of the anima onto a fairy-like woman, producing a destructive fantasy relationship. In Madame Bovary, the 19th century French novelist Flaubert describes a love madness caused by an anima projection. By her constantly changing moods, sometimes mystical, sometimes gay, now talkative, now silent, sometimes passionate, sometimes superior. She knew how to evoke a thousand desires in him, a thousand instincts and memories. She was the beloved one of all novels, the heroine of all plays, the she of all poems he had ever read. On her shoulders he found the amber glow of the bathing odalisque. She had the long waist of ladies in the chivalric age. She also looked like the pale lady of Barcelona, but she was always an angel. Left, Emma Bovary, in the 1949 film of the novel, with her husband, Left, and lover. Men project the anima onto things as well as women. For instance, ships are always known as she. Above, the female figurehead on the old British clipper ship Cutty Sark. The captain of a ship is symbolically her husband, which may be why he must, according to tradition, go down with the ship if she sinks. A car is another kind of possession that is usually feminized, that is, that can become the focus of many men's anima projections. Like ships, cars are called she, and their owners caress and pamper them, below, like favorite mistresses. Two stages in the development of the anima. First, primitive woman, above, from a painting by Gauguin. Second, romanticized beauty, as in the idealized portrait left of a Renaissance Italian girl who is depicted as Cleopatra. The second stage was classically embodied in Helen of Troy, below with Paris. Above, the anima's third stage is personified as the Virgin Mary, in a painting by Van Eyck. 
The red of her robe is the symbolic color of feeling, or eros, but in this stage the eros has become spiritualized. Below, two examples of the fourth stage, the Greek goddess of wisdom Athena, left, and the Mona Lisa. Left, a 17th century engraving dominated by the symbolic figure of the anima as mediator between this world, the monkey, probably representing man's instinctual nature, and the next, the hand of God reaching from the clouds. The anima figure seems to parallel the woman of the apocalypse, who also wore a crown of twelve stars, antiquity's moon goddesses, the Old Testament sapientia, the fourth stage of the anima, see earlier in this chapter, and the Egyptian goddess Isis, who also had flowing hair, a half moon at her womb, and stood with one foot on land and one on water. Right. The anima is mediator, or guide, in a drawing by William Blake. It illustrates a scene from the Purgatorio of Dante's Divine Comedy and shows Beatrice leading Dante along a symbolically tortuous mountain path. Far right, from an early film of Ryder Haggard's novel She, a mysterious woman leads explorers through mountains. A connection between the motif of four and the anima appears above in a painting by the Swiss artist Peter Birkhäuser. A four-eyed anima appears as an overwhelming, terrifying vision. The four eyes have a symbolic significance similar to that of the sixteen pictures in the dream quoted earlier in this chapter. They allude to the fact that the anima contains the possibility of achieving wholeness. In the painting, right, by the modern artist Slavko, the self is separate from the anima but still merged with nature. The painting can be called a soul landscape. On the left sits a dark-skinned, naked woman, the anima. On the right is a bear, the animal soul or instinct. Near the anima is a double tree, symbolizing the individuation process in which the inner opposites unite. In the background, one at first sees a glacier, but on looking closely, one sees that it is also a face. This face, from which the life stream flows, is the self. It has four eyes and looks something like an animal because it comes from instinctive nature. The painting thus provides a good example of the way an unconscious symbol can inadvertently find its way into a fantasy landscape. Medieval Europe's idea of courtly love was influenced by the worship of the Virgin Mary. Ladies to whom knights pledged love were believed to be as pure as the Virgin, of whom a typical medieval image was the doll-like carving, top of page, about 1400. On a 15th century shield, far left, a knight kneels to his lady, with death behind him. This idealized view of woman produced an opposing view, the belief in witches. Left, a 19th century painting of a witch's Sabbath. When the anima is projected onto an official personification, she tends to fall apart into a double aspect, such as Mary and witch. Left, another opposing duality from a 15th century manuscript. Personifications of the church, on the right, identified with Mary, and of the synagogue, here identified with the sinful Eve. Above, Joan of Arc, played by Ingrid Bergman in the 1948 film, whose animus, the male side of the female psyche, took the form of a sacred conviction. Right, two images of the negative animus, a 16th century painting of a woman dancing with death, and, from a manuscript about 1500, Hades was Persephone, whom he abducted to the underworld. Heathcliff, the sinister protagonist of the British author Emily Bronte's novel Wuthering Heights, 1847, is partly a negative, demonic animus figure, probably a manifestation of Emily Bronte's own animus. In the montage above, Heathcliff, played by Laurence Olivier in the 1939 film, confronts Emily, a portrait by her brother, in the background, Wuthering Heights as it is today. Two examples of dangerous animus figures. Left, an illustration by the 19th century French artist Gustave Doré to the folk tale of Bluebeard. Here Bluebeard warns his wife against opening a certain door. Of course she does so, and finds the corpses of Bluebeard's former wives. She is caught and joins her predecessors. Right, a 19th century painting of the highwayman Claude Duval, 
who once robbed a lady traveler but gave his booty back on the condition that she dance with him by the roadside. The animus is often personified as a group of men. A negative group animus might appear as a dangerous band of criminals like the wreckers above in an 18th century Italian painting who once lured ships onto rocks with lights, killed survivors, and looted the wrecks. A frequent personification of the negative group animus in women's dreams has been the band of romantic but dangerous outlaws. Above, an ominous group of bandits from the 1953 Brazilian film The Bandit, concerning an adventurous woman schoolteacher who falls in love with a bandit leader. Below, an illustration by Fusely of Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. The Fairy Queen has been caused by magic to fall in love with a peasant who has been given an ass's head, also by magic. This is a comic twist on the tales in which a girl's love releases a man from a magic spell. Above left, the singer Franz Kras in the title role of Wagner's opera The Flying Dutchman, based on the tale of the sea captain doomed to sail a ghost ship until a woman's love breaks the curse on him. In many myths, a woman's lover is a figure of mystery whom she must never try to see. Left, a late 18th century engraving of an example from Greek myth, the maiden Psyche, loved by Eros but forbidden to try to look at him. Eventually she did so, and he left her. She was able to regain his love only after a long search and much suffering. Embodiments of the Four Stages of the Animus First, the Holy Physical Man the fictional jungle hero Tarzan, Top, played by Johnny Weissmuller. Second, the romantic man, the 19th century British poet Shelley, center left, or the man of action, America's Ernest Hemingway, war hero, hunter, etc. Third, the bearer of the word, Lloyd George, the great political orator. Fourth, the wise guide to spiritual truth, often projected onto Gandhi, left. Above right, an Indian miniature of a girl gazing with love at a man's portrait. A woman falling in love with a picture or a film star is clearly projecting her animus onto the man. The actor Rudolf Valentino, right, in a film made in 1922, became the focus of animus projection for thousands of women while he lived and even after he died. Far right, part of the immense floral tribute sent by women all over the world to Valentino's funeral in 1926. The self, the inner center of the total psyche, is often personified in dreams as a superior human figure. To women, the self might appear as a wise and powerful goddess, like the ancient Greek mother goddess Demeter, right, shown with her son Triptolemus and daughter Cori in a 5th century B.C. relief. The fairy godmother of many tales is also a symbolic personification of the female self. Above, Cinderella's godmother, from an illustration by Gustave Doré. Below, a helpful old woman, also a fairy godmother, rescues a girl in an illustration of a Hans Christian Andersen tale. Personifications of the self in men's dreams often take the form of wise old men. Far left the magician Merlin of the Arthurian legends in a 14th century English manuscript. Center, a guru, wise man, from an 18th century Indian painting. Left, a winged old man like this appeared in one of Dr. Jung's own dreams, carrying keys. According to Dr. Jung, he represented superior insight. The self usually appears in dreams at crucial times in the dreamer's life turning points when his basic attitudes and whole way of life are changing. The change itself is often symbolized by the action of crossing water. Above, an actual river crossing that accompanied an important upheaval, George Washington's crossing of the Delaware River during the American Revolution in a 19th century American painting. Narrator's note. The painting is entitled Washington at the Passage of the Delaware by Thomas Sully, and is reproduced courtesy of the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. End of narrator's note. Left, another major event that involved crossing water. The first attack launched against the Normandy beaches on D-Day, June 1944. The self is not always personified as a superior old person. Left, 
a painting of a dream by Peter Bierkhäuser in which the self appears as a marvelous youth. While the artist was working on the painting, other associations and ideas came up from his unconscious. The round object like a sun behind the youth is a symbol of totality, and the boy's four arms recall other fourfold symbols that characterize psychological wholeness. Before the boy's hands hovers a flower, as if he need only raise his hands and a magical flower will appear. He is black because of his nocturnal, that is, unconscious origin. Many people today personify the self in their dreams as prominent public figures. Jungian psychologists find that in men's dreams, Dr. Albert Schweitzer, far left, and Sir Winston Churchill, left, often appear. In women's dreams... Eleanor Roosevelt, right, and Queen Elizabeth II, far right, a portrait on an African house. Cosmic Man, the gigantic, all-embracing figure that personifies and contains the entire universe, is a common representation of the self in myths and dreams. Left, the title page of Leviathan by the 17th century English philosopher Thomas Hobbes. The gigantic figure of Leviathan is made up of all the people of the Commonwealth, Hobbes's ideal society in which the people choose their own central authority or sovereign, hence Leviathan's crown, sword, and scepter. Above, the cosmic figure of ancient China's Pan Ku, shown covered in leaves to indicate that cosmic man, or first man, simply existed like a plant grown in nature. Below, On a leaf from an 18th century Indian illuminated manuscript, the cosmic lion goddess holding the sun. The lion is made up of many people and animals. Top left, a Rhodesian rock painting of a creation myth in which the first man, the moon, mates with the morning star and evening star to produce the creatures of earth. Cosmic man often appears as an Adam-like original man, and Christ too has become identified with this personification of the self. Top right, a painting by the 15th century German artist Grunewald shows the figure of Christ with all the majesty of cosmic man. Examples of the royal couple, a symbolic image of psychic totality and the self. Left, a 3rd century A.D. Indian sculpture of Shiva and Parvati hermaphroditically joined. Below, the Hindu deities Krishna and Radha in a grove. The Greek head, below left, was shown by Dr. Jung to be subtly two-sided, that is, hermaphroditic. In a letter to the owner, Jung added that the head has, like his analogues Adonis, Tammuz, and Balder, all the grace and charm of either sex. Right, a pre-Roman sculpture of the Celtic bear goddess Arzio, found at Bern, which means bear. She was probably a mother goddess, resembling the she-bear in the dream quoted earlier in this chapter. Further correspondences to symbolic images in this dream. Center, Australian aborigines with their sacred stones, which they believe contain the spirits of the dead. Bottom, from a 17th century alchemical manuscript, the symbolic royal couple as a pair of lions. In dreams, a mirror can symbolize the power of the unconscious to mirror the individual objectively, giving him a view of himself that he may never have had before. Only through the unconscious can such a view, which often shocks and upsets the conscious mind, be obtained, just as in Greek myth, the Gorgon Medusa, whose look turned men to stone, could be gazed upon only in a mirror. Below, Medusa reflected in a shield, a painting by the 17th century artist Caravaggio. Often the self is represented as a helpful animal, a symbol of the psyche's instinctual basis. Top left, the magic fox of Grimm's fairy tale, the golden bird. Center, the Hindu monkey god Hanuman carrying two gods in his heart. Bottom, Rin Tin Tin, the heroic dog once popular in American films and television. Stones are frequent images of the self because they are complete, that is, unchanging, and lasting. Many people today look for stones of special beauty, perhaps on beaches, top right. Some Hindus pass from father to son stones, center, 
believed to have magical powers. Precious stones, like the jewels of Queen Elizabeth I, 1558 to 163, bottom, are an outward sign of wealth and position. The eternal quality of stones can be seen in pebbles or mountains. Left, rocks beneath Mount Williamson, California. Thus stone has always been used for memorials, like the heads of four U.S. presidents, above, carved in the cliff face of Mount Rushmore, South Dakota. Stones were also often used to mark places of worship, as was the sacred stone in the Temple of Jerusalem, far right. It was the center of the city, and as the medieval map, right, shows, the city was seen as the center of the world. Left, the black stone of Mecca, blessed by Muhammad, in an Arabic manuscript illustration, to integrate it into the Islamic religion. It is carried by four tribal chieftains at the four corners of a carpet into the Kaaba, the holy sanctuary to which thousands of Muslims make an annual pilgrimage, below left. Right, another symbolic stone, the Stone of Scan or Stone of Destiny, on which Scottish kings were formerly crowned. It was taken to England's Westminster Abbey in the 13th century, but it never lost its importance for Scotland. On Christmas Day, 1950, a group of Scottish nationalists stole the stone from the Abbey and took it back to Scotland. It was returned to the Abbey in April, 1951. Right. A tourist kisses the famous Blarney Stone of Irish legend. It is supposed to confer the gift of eloquence on those who kiss it. A painting by the modern artist Hans Hafenrichter resembles the pattern of a crystal, like ordinary stone, a symbol of wholeness. The feelings of boredom and apathy from which city dwellers today often suffer is only temporarily offset by such artificial excitements as adventure films, far left, and time-killing amusements, left. Jung stressed that the only real adventure remaining for each individual is the exploration of his own unconscious. The ultimate goal of such a search is the forming of a harmonious and balanced relationship with the self. The circular mandala images this perfect balance, embodied in the structure of the modern cathedral, right, of the city of Brasilia. Top. A Navajo makes a sand painting, a mandala, in a healing ritual. The patient sits in the painting. Above. A plan of a sand painting. It must be circled by a patient before entering. Left, a winter landscape by the German artist Kaspar Friedrich. Landscape paintings usually express indefinable moods, as do symbolic landscapes in dreams. In the paintings left of the dream quoted earlier in this chapter, painted by the dreamer, the mandala motif appears as a quadrangle rather than a circle. Usually, quadrangular forms symbolize conscious realization of inner wholeness. The wholeness itself is most often represented in circular forms, such as the round table that also appears in the dream. Right, the legendary round table of King Arthur, from a 15th century manuscript, at which the Holy Grail appeared in a vision and started the knights on the famous quest. The Grail itself symbolizes the inner wholeness for which men have always been searching. Far left. The torrential waters of the river Heraclitus overwhelm a Greek temple in a painting by the modern French artist André Masson. The painting can be seen as an allegory of the results of imbalance, Greek overemphasis on logic and reason, the temple, leading to a destructive eruption of instinctual forces. Left, a more direct allegory from a 15th century illustration to the French allegorical poem Le Roman de la Rose, the figure of logic on the right is thrown into confusion when confronted by nature. Right, the repentant St. Mary Magdalene gazes into a mirror in a painting by the 17th century French artist Georges de la Tour. Here, as in the tale of the Bath Badgard, the mirror symbolizes the much-needed faculty of true, inward-looking reflection. The achievement of psychological maturity is an individual task, and so is increasingly difficult today when man's individuality is threatened by widespread conformity. Far left, a British housing development with its stereotyped dwellings. Left, a Swiss athletics display provides an image of mass regimentation. 
above, a page from William Blake's Songs of Innocence and Experience, in which the poems reveal Blake's concept of the divine child, a well-known symbol of the self. Right, a 16th century painting of St. Christopher carrying Christ as a divine child, who is encircled by a world sphere, a mandala and a symbol of the self. This burden symbolizes the weight of the task of individuation, just as St. Christopher's role as the patron of travelers, far right, a St. Christopher medallion on a car's ignition key, reflects his link with man's need to travel the path to psychological wholeness. The conscious realization of the self can create a bond among people that ignores more obvious natural groups like the family, above left. A mental kinship on a conscious level can often be the nucleus of cultural development. Above, the 18th century French encyclopedists, including Voltaire with raised hand. Below, a painting by Max Ernst of the early 20th century Dadaist artists and research physicists at Britain's Wills Laboratory. The psychological balance and unity that man needs today have been symbolized in many modern dreams by the union of the French girl and the Japanese man in the widely popular French film Hiroshima Mon Amour, 1959, above, and in the same dreams the opposite extreme from wholeness, that is, complete psychological dissociation or madness, has been symbolized by a related 20th century image, a nuclear explosion, right? As in the dream quoted earlier in this chapter, positive anima figures often assist and guide men. Top of page, from a 10th century Psalter, David inspired by the muse. Above, a goddess saves a shipwrecked sailor in a 16th century painting. Right, on an early 20th century postcard from Monte Carlo, gambler's Lady Luck, also a helpful anima. Right, Liberty, leading the French revolutionaries in a painting by Delacroix, images the anima's function of assisting individuation by liberating unconscious contents. Far right, in a scene from the 1925 fantasy film Metropolis, a woman urges robot-like workers to find spiritual liberation. This 15th century statue of Mary contains within it images of both God and Christ, a clear expression of the fact that the Virgin Mary can be said to be a representation of the Great Mother archetype. A miniature from the 15th century French Book of Hours, showing Mary with the Holy Trinity, the Catholic Church's dogma of the Assumption of the Virgin, in which Mary, as Domina Rerum, Queen of Nature, was declared to have entered heaven with soul and body reunited, can be said to have made the Trinity fourfold corresponding with the basic archetype of completeness. Paintings of the dreams discussed earlier in this chapter. Left, the spiral, a form of mandala, represents the Holy Ghost. Right, the dark wing of Satan from the second dream. Neither motif would be a familiar religious symbol to most people, nor were they to the dreamer. Each emerged spontaneously from the unconscious. This painting by Erhard Jacobi illustrates the fact that each of us, perceiving the world through an individual psyche, perceives it in a slightly different way from others. The man, woman, and child are looking at the same scene, but for each, different details become clear or obscured. Only by means of our conscious perception does the world exist outside. We are surrounded by something completely unknown and unknowable here represented by the painting's gray background. End of photo captions. Part 4. Symbolism in the Visual Arts by Aniela Jaffe. Sacred Symbols. The Stone and the Animal. The history of symbolism shows that everything can assume symbolic significance. Natural objects like stones, plants, animals, men, mountains and valleys, sun and moon, wind, water and fire, or man-made things like houses, boats or cars, or even abstract forms like numbers or the triangle, the square and the circle. In fact, the whole cosmos is a potential symbol. Man, with his symbol-making propensity, unconsciously transforms objects or forms into symbols, thereby endowing them with great psychological importance and expresses them in both his religion and his visual art. 
The intertwined history of religion and art, reaching back to prehistoric times, is the record that our ancestors have left of the symbols that were meaningful and moving to them. Even today, as modern painting and sculpture show, the interplay of religion and art is still alive. For the first part of my discussion of symbolism in the visual arts, I intend to examine some of the specific motifs that have been universally sacred or mysterious to man. Then, for the remainder of the chapter, I wish to discuss the phenomenon of twentieth-century art not in terms of its use of symbols, but in terms of its significance as a symbol itself, a symbolic expression of the psychological condition of the modern world. In the following pages, I have chosen three recurring motifs with which to illustrate the presence and nature of symbolism in the art of many different periods. These are the symbols of the stone, the animal, and the circle, each of which has had enduring psychological significance from the earliest expressions of human consciousness to the most sophisticated forms of twentieth-century art. We know that even unhewn stones had a highly symbolic meaning for ancient and primitive societies. Rough, natural stones were often believed to be the dwelling places of spirits or gods, and were used in primitive cultures as tombstones, boundary stones, or objects of religious veneration. Their use may be regarded as a primeval form of sculpture, a first attempt to invest the stone with more expressive power than chance and nature could give it. The Old Testament story of Jacob's dream is a typical example of how, thousands of years ago, man felt that a living God or a divine spirit was embodied in the stone, and how the stone became a symbol. And Jacob went toward Haran, and he lighted upon a certain place, and tarried there all night, because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of the place, and put them for his pillows, and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it, and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed." And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid, and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning, and took the stone that he had put for his pillows, and set it up for a pillar, and poured oil upon the top of it, and he called the name of that place Bethel. For Jacob the stone was an integral part of the revelation. It was the mediator between himself and God. In many primitive stone sanctuaries, the deity is represented not by a single stone, but by a great many unhewn stones arranged in distinct patterns. The geometrical stone alignments in Brittany and the stone circle at Stonehenge are famous examples. Arrangements of rough natural stones also play a considerable part in the highly civilized rock gardens of Zen Buddhism. Their arrangement is not geometrical, but seems to have come about by pure chance. In fact, however, it is the expression of a most refined spirituality. Very early in history, men began trying to express what they felt to be the soul or spirit of a rock by working it into a recognizable form. In many cases, the form was a more or less definite approximation to the human figure, for instance, the ancient menhirs with their crude outlines of faces, or the herms that developed out of boundary stones in ancient Greece, or the many primitive stone idols with human features. The animation of the stone must be explained as the projection of a more or less distinct content of the unconscious into the stone. The primitive tendency to give merely a hint of a human figure and to retain much of the stone's natural form, can also be seen in modern sculpture. Many examples show the artist's concern with the self-expression of the stone. To use the language of myth, the stone is allowed to speak for itself. This can be seen, for instance, in the work of the Swiss sculptor Hans Eschenbacher, the American sculptor James Rosati, and the German-born artist Max Ernst. In a letter from Maloja in 1935, Ernst wrote, Alberto, the Swiss artist Giacometti, and I are afflicted with sculpturitis. We work on granite boulders, large and small, from the moraine of the Forno Glacier. Wonderfully polished by time, frost, and weather, 
They are in themselves fantastically beautiful. No human hand can do that. So why not leave the spade work to the elements and confine ourselves to scratching on them the runes of our own mystery? What Ernst meant by mystery is not explained, but later in this chapter I shall try to show that the mysteries of the modern artist are not very different from those of the old masters who knew the spirit of the stone. The emphasis on this spirit in much sculpture is one indication of the shifting, indefinable borderline between religion and art. Sometimes one cannot be separated from the other. The same ambivalence can also be seen in another symbolic motif, as it appears in age-old works of art, the symbol of the animal. Animal pictures go back to the last ice age, between 60,000 and 10,000 B.C., They were discovered on the walls of caves in France and Spain at the end of the last century, but it was not until early in the present century that archaeologists began to realize their extreme importance and to inquire into their meaning. These inquiries revealed an infinitely remote prehistoric culture whose existence had never even been suspected. Even today, a strange music seems to haunt the caves that contain the rock engravings and paintings. According to the German art historian Herbert Kuhn, Inhabitants of the areas in Africa, Spain, France, and Scandinavia where such paintings are found could not be induced to go near the caves. A kind of religious awe or perhaps a fear of spirits hovering among the rocks and the paintings held them back. Passing nomads still lay their votive offerings before the old rock paintings in North Africa. In the 15th century, Pope Calixtus II prohibited religious ceremonies in the cave with the horse pictures. Which cave, the